Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Thought we'd take a break from the uh, prove your own self studies. Uh, this was brought to my attention. We're going to do an expository study today. I know, I know. Expository studies are lazy, but we're just going to be lazy today. Right? So <laughs> get out your King James Bibles and open your Bibles to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. We're going to do an expository study. I'm going to be going through a lot of verses. I'm just going to keep the Bible open as we go down verse by verse in Matthew 25. We're going to be going over the ten virgins. I've had some questions asked about the ten virgins. Who are they? Uh, do they lose their salvation? Um, how, I mean, what time period is this? Does it apply to us, the, the, the church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ? That's going to be important in this study. Okay. So the best way to do something is do an expository study. Okay. Uh, remember, there's expository studies, subject studies, and word studies. And I just want to say this. I did. I, I told myself I wouldn't be too sarcastic, but there's some brethren out there that believe that they used to do amazing uh, expository studies, and they got lazy. And when other men in ministry started doing expository studies, when they weren't doing expository studies, they got very envious. And they start saying, lazy expository studies. When we get done with this study, you let me know how lazy it is, okay? It takes a lot of work to do an expository study. A lot of work, okay? Um, you can just read verse by verse and give your two cents, but we're not going to read verse by verse and just give our two cents. We're going to read verse by verse, and we're going to compare Scripture with Scripture with Scripture with Scripture. That's the proper way to do an expository study. So the ten virgins, Matthew 25, 1. I'm going to start with Matthew 25, 1. Before we get into it, because we're going to get into this, it's going to be a long study, multi-part. Uh, God really put it on my heart. I started a little bit just because I wanted to get some answers for myself. And then God's like, well, why don't you share with the brethren what I shared with you? And that's what I'm doing, Brother Jesus Christ. So I pray that you're all doing well, that you're staying in the Word of God every morning and every night, that you're staying in prayer, that you're not becoming part of this... Uh, this, fest, this, this disease that's running rampant in the body of Christ that has to, that's trying to keep brethren from loving one another. You know, brethren are starting to have you know, bitterness towards one another, hate towards one another, anger towards one another without a cause. And even if you have a cause, if they repent, forgive them. Get back to good fellowship with the brothers and sisters in Christ. All right. But I'm praying for you, brothers, just Christ. I really am. So Matthew 25, 1, before we get into this, one thing i got to make clear real quick. When you get into the ten virgins, um, it talks about the bride, not uh, bride, uh, the, the, yeah, the bridegroom. It talks about the groom, the bridegroom, and it talks about the ten virgins. The bride's not mentioned. It's important when we go through this study, but what I need to do to get us set up for this parable is in the Old Testament, and I haven't done this, you guys can do it on your own, Brother Sis Christ, you can look in the study of how marriages were done in the Old Testament. The marriages were done where you had a bridegroom, you had the bride, and the bride would have uh, virgins with her. Okay, And that's how it was done in the Jewish, okay, for the Jews, because this parable, when we get done with it, you, if you disagree, then I don't know what to tell you. It's for the Jews, and for a certain time period, okay, get a little ahead of myself, but you have the bridegroom as part of the marriage supper, the part of the, the, the whole marriage ceremony. You have the bridegroom, you have the bride, and you have the bridesmaids. No best man, bridegroom, bride, and bridesmaids. Okay. So you have the bride and the bride. When we get done with this, you have the bridegroom and the bride. They're getting ready to do this marriage ceremony, and you have the virgins that are going out to meet them. Because they're part of the ceremony. Okay. Not trying to get too ahead of myself, but just that you have to, like I said, you go have to go through the Old Testament and study this when people are getting married. Okay. So Matthew 25, 1. Let's get started on this. It's going to be a long expository study, a lot of work. Like I said, I'm going to follow scripture by scripture with Matthew 25, and then I'm going to just read off other verses. Make sure you pause the video and turn there yourself, because like I said, turning is amazing. That's what I do. When I'm watching a study, I pause the video, I turn there, and I read and follow along. And the next thing I know, it helps me know where all the books are. It helps me flip around faster. You get faster at it. But for, the, for a time when I'm doing videos, for 
purpose of time, so they're not super long. I tend to like to use a lot of scripture. A lot of brethren, when they do teachings, they'll use one or two scriptures in the next verse. One scripture, the next verse. I, I, I really love the Word of God. And I'm not saying they don't, but I tend to overdo it. That's my fault. I tend to overdo it. I love the verses. I like to use verses after verse after verse after verse. So forgive me because we're going to be going through a lot of verses in between each, each verse here in our expository study. So the first verse, Matthew 25, 1. Matthew 25, 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now as we get into there, the lamps, the oil for the lamp, I believe, has to do with endurance. Enduring. Being able to endure to the end. I'm getting ahead of myself. But there's three things here. You've got the lamps that require oil in order to burn. And if you want a lamp to endure the night, if you, let's say you light a lamp at night, you want it outside to scare the animals away. I have lights that I light up. We use electricity, but I have lights all around the house. But if they were oil lamps, I'd have to make sure they have enough oil in it that they would endure the night and make it through the night. Okay? So when we get into this, think, when you see the oil and they start talking about the oil, think enduring. Because that's, that's a good thought. But also we have here kingdom of heaven that we're going to be talking about. And then we're going to be talking about went forth to meet the bridegroom. Went forth to meet the bridegroom. Right. So first thing we're going to talk about is kingdom of heaven. This is a big thing with the post-trib uh, and the mid-trib. Right. I'm getting ahead of myself, but you have the kingdom of heaven. It's mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. Matthew 3, chapter 3, verse 1, we read, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Who's preaching it? John the Baptist. Now this is just a rabbit trail. The pot, I mean, just pot, We're going to pause what we're talking about here just for a second because i got to go off a little bit. I don't have to, but I want to. Please bear with me, brothers of Christ. Uh, John the Baptist. John was called a Baptist and the uh, what he preached, okay, was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. A Baptist, a true Baptist, is preaching repent and be baptized for the remission of sins for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Water baptism. It's Old Testament. In the early book of Acts, you've got them doing it again where they're preaching repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Where are they preaching? The kingdom of heaven. You crucified your king, but he is risen. If you believe he's your king and that he is risen, he can come back and rule and reign for a thousand years. But they rejected him again, and it went from, if you read the book of Acts, or the book of Acts, it went from repent and be baptized for the remission of sins to repent, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Repent and believe. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. It changed. Why? Because it's a transition period. And the reason I say that is there's no such thing as a Baptist today. Just want to throw that out there. There's no Baptist today, but you have people that will grab things from the Old Testament and try to apply it to today. Well, I'm a Baptist. Well, you might be a Baptist, but I'm a fundamental Baptist. Oh yeah, you might be a fundamental Baptist, but I'm an independent fundamental Baptist. There are no Baptists today. Today, we're not baptized with water. We're not baptized for the remission of sins with water and believing in the kingdom of heaven. That's not today. Right? Today, we are baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, no, don't fear him that's able to destroy the body, but fear him that's able to destroy both body and soul in hell. And John the Baptist sees Jesus Christ and says, Beholdeth the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And he talks about how he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That's what's going on today. Those are the two baptisms. The Holy Spirit and fire. You get saved, you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, not water. And if you're lost and you die in your sins, you're going to be baptized with fire, hell, and the lake of fire. Okay. John the Baptist, he preached a gospel. Is that gospel for us today? No. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Flip over to Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. 
From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What happened here? John the Baptist got locked up in prison. Then he got beheaded, but he got locked up in prison. The moment he got locked up in prison, Jesus went out and he started preaching the kingdom of heaven. Remember what John the Baptist said? I must become less so he can become more. He was just paving the way. He was, he was a transition, paving the way for Jesus to come and preach the kingdom of heaven. Here you have the actual king, capital K, king, preaching the kingdom of heaven. Right. Matthew 10, verse 5. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. Were these two the only two preaching the kingdom of heaven? This is the key verse here, brothers and Christ. This is the key verse. Matthew 10, 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not in the way of the Gentiles. Go not in the way of the Gentiles. Give me a second. Victoria, come here. Victoria. Victoria's walking around. Stay. I apologize for that. When she starts walking around, it makes a lot of noise on these wood floors. Let's get back to Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not in the way of the Gentiles. Okay, so what you're going to be preaching, the message that you're going to be preaching is not for the Gentiles. And into the city of the Samaritans, it's not for the Samaritans. Now, we did a uh, talk about this, brothers and Christ. I believe the Samaritans are Jews that have lost the inheritance. They're treated like they don't exist. That's why the Jews had no, biz, no dealings whatsoever with the Samaritans. They did with the Gentiles, lost heathens, but they had no dealings with the Samaritans. When you see Jesus at the well talking to the woman, and the apostles comes and sees him, he's talking to a Samaritan. And she says, Our father Jacob have dug, dug this well. Her father Jacob? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? What are Samaritans? I believe Samaritans are Jews that, and prove me wrong, but I believe Samaritans are not from Samaria. They're Jews that have lost the inheritance. Okay? But this message, this inheritance, remember they lost the inheritance, this message about an inheritance is not to be preached to the Gentiles. It's not to pre preach to the Samaritans. Like I said, the Jews that have lost that inheritance, enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And what are they preaching? And as, they, and as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven. It's not for the Gentiles. It's not for the Jews that have lost the inheritance. Who's it for? Amen. Now, as we get through this, remember, kingdom of heaven... I'm sorry... Kingdom of Heaven, yeah, Kingdom of Heaven, Day of the Lord, and Kingdom of, of God, all three can be a reference to the physical kingdom. How do we know that? Matthew 11, 1, turn to Matthew chapter 11, verse 1. Or, sorry, chapter 11, verse 12. Matthew 11, verse 12. And from the day of John the Baptist unto now, the Kingdom of Heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. You can't take the spiritual kingdom by force. You can take the physical kingdom by force. Israel in the Old Testament was taken over by uh, Nebuchadnezzar. The temple was destroyed twice and rebuilt twice. They've been taken over by so many different people. Even to this day, they fight over that land. There's people fighting over that land. What's the kingdom of heaven? It's the physical kingdom. It's never a reference to the spiritual. It's always a reference to the physical. Now, remember the day of the Lord? I said there's also the day of the Lord. They're all, that's that thousand year time. I say the thousand year time period. But remember, when I've done this study, what I've learned is when it says kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, the day of the Lord, that day and that day, sometimes it'll include the transition period going over into that day and the transition period going from the day into eternity. It'll include all three parts as that day. Now technically the day is just the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, but it tends to include the transition periods. If you're dispensational, you understand what I'm talking about. 
When a dispensation is going to end and a new dispensation is going to start, there's a transition period between the two. And it can be applied to the, to, it's usually applied to the next transition as it's going into. All right. So there's times where it's talking about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God as it applies to the kingdom of heaven, the day of the Lord, and it's including parts of the time of Jacob's trouble because the time of Jacob's trouble is the transition period into the day of the Lord. Okay? Sometimes it will include, that's what confuses, I believe, a lot of people. It confused me for a while. So God opened my eyes and said, hey, I'm including parts of the transition. I'm concluding half of the time of Jacob's trouble. The, as it transitions into the day of the Lord. Okay. 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Peter 3.9 But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. A thousand years is one day. Okay, so when you say the day of the Lord, it's a thousand year period for, for the, that time period. 1 Corinthians 1.8, here's where we learn about it, because it's in the Pauline epistles. 1 Corinthians 1.8, who shall also confirm you unto the end? What's the end here? Well, this is a whole other study, and we've done some of the studies. You compare scripture with scripture. The end here is talking about the catching away of the body of Christ. Who shall also confirm you to the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you suffer for Jesus Christ? If you suffer with him, you shall also reign with him. You will be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of us get to come back with him at the day of the Lord. And we're going to read some of those verses. Some of us get to come back with him. Some don't. Why? Because you're not blameless in that day. You didn't suffer for Jesus Christ. Right? We talk about this. I'm getting ahead of myself again because we're going to read this. We're going to read some verses over like more than once. But the Bible says, God knoweth them that are his. In God's house, there's not only silver and gold, but earth, wood and earth. Some to honor, some to dishonor. You have some people that get saved and they don't amount to nothing as a Christian because they are too afraid to suffer for Jesus Christ. They don't want to live the life of Christ. They start out doing it. I believe that there's, there's evidence that they got saved, the changed life. They're going 100 miles an hour and that first wall that they hit, what happens? They stop. And they never quite get back up and get going again. They go back to looking like the world, acting like the world. Okay, they become part of the falling away. They don't amount to much of anything. There's going to be some people that get to come back with Jesus Christ to rule and reign in the day of the Lord, and some that won't. Which one are you, Brother Sis Christ? Something really to look into. Like I said, it's a whole other study. 1 Thessalonians 5.2 for yourselves know perfectly that that day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Why are we being told this? Because if the day of the Lord, at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, comes as a thief in the night, then the catching away of the body of Christ that happens before the time of Jacob's trouble is also going to be like a thief in the night. We don't know when it's going to happen. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour. We don't know the year. We don't know anything. All we know is that the Bible teaches that for my lifetime, I'm supposed to look for Jesus Christ and live a life as if Jesus Christ could come back tomorrow. That's how we're supposed to live today. Why? We don't know when Jesus is going to come back. So if you want to be prepared, you need to, act, you need to live as if Jesus could come back tomorrow. What are you getting done for Him today? You have brethren that have turned their backs on this. Okay. Let's keep going. Second Peter three ten. There's some brethren have turned their back on it. They're going to get caught fall in a fallen state because they're not prepared for Jesus to catch his his bride away. They won't be ready for it. They're too distracted by the flesh, the world, and Satan. Second Peter two, because that's where their eyes are on. I have to say this. That's where their eyes are on. Our eyes are supposed to be on Jesus Christ, looking for that blessed hope. Loving the great appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our eyes are supposed to be on Jesus Christ, not this body, wicked body of flesh. Not this wicked world. Not Satan. 2 Peter 3.10 But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. In the time of Jacob's trouble, a third of the trees are burnt up. Then a third of the trees that remain are burnt up. 
and then the third, those trees that remain are burnt up, and there's just a small remnant of the earth that survives that time, a very small remnant. Some people would say one-third, 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 that's three-thirds, so all the trees get burnt up. But that's not real math. The real math is if you had, I would say, if you had 90 trees, I'm just doing a small number, you had 90 trees, a third of those trees get burnt up, that's 30 trees, because you have 30, 30, 30. So that leaves you with 60 trees. Then a third of those trees get burnt up. That's not going to be 30 this time. It's going to be 20. 20, 20, 20 makes 60. So now you're left with 40. Then a third of those get burnt up. And that leaves you with um, 20, 21, 22 trees. So there's still a small remnant of trees that will make it through. But everything's getting burnt up. Remember, Mystery Babylon gets destroyed, utterly destroyed. The day of the Lord oftentimes includes the transition from the time of Jacob's trouble and to the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. Okay. It oftentimes includes that. So when it tells you that that day, the day Lord, uh, but that day will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away, it starts talking about the transition period leading into the day of the Lord. Okay. But you see there we have the day of the Lord. Romans 14, 17. Turn to, you can turn to Romans 14, 17. Okay. Romans 14, 17. What we're going to get into here real quick, I know it's a lot for just that first verse, kingdom of heaven. so important to understand what the kingdom of heaven is. It's that physical kingdom where Jesus is going to rule and reign. Now, I got a testimony. I got into it with a post. I Skyped with some, uh, a young man. I pray he is saved and he's just confused and that the Holy Spirit will bring him into all truth. But there's a chance he's not saved. Okay. But I got to talking to him, and we, he kept trying to go to the Old Testament to prove that we go through that time period. Okay? He wouldn't stick to the Pauline epistles because it's nowhere in the Pauline epistles that we go through that time period, the time of Jacob's trouble. We, get, we have a part now. As we go through this study, Jews, uh, Gentiles, and uh, the Samaritans had no part in the, time, uh, in, the, in the kingdom of heaven. But since they rejected us and sal uh, rejected Jesus Christ and salvation has gone out to the world, now the Samaritans can get saved. Now the Gentiles can get saved. Now we get adopted in and now we have a part in that inheritance. But the time of Jacob's trouble is not for us. And one of the things he, they would do is they would grab from the Old Testament and say this, Romans 14, 7, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom, but they always say the, the kingdom of God always is a spiritual kingdom. Anytime you see kingdom of God, it's a spiritual kingdom every time. They don't do 2 Timothy 2.15, which we're going to do right here. They also pull up Luke 17.21. Luke 17.21. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, they'll say that we deny this. No, we don't. Kingdom of God can be a reference to the spiritual kingdom. And both references there absolutely is the spiritual kingdom. I'm not denying that. But here's what they do. They turn to Mark, 4, 4, turn to Mark chapter 4, verse 11. Mark chapter 4, verse 11. They'll turn to Mark 4, 11 and say, this is the, the parable of the sower. They'll say, read this. And he said unto them, Unto you is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. See, the spiritual kingdom. Let's keep reading. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may not see, that seeing that, I'm sorry, that seeing they may see and not perceive. Sounds familiar with the guy I was talking to. And hearing they may hear and not understand lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. That's thought. This conversion is talking about the, the kingdom of heaven. It's not talking about today. Well, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. But it says kingdom of God. They say it's the spiritual kingdom and they, they'll try to apply that to us saying we can't understand because we're the ones with the hard hearts. No, let's keep reading. And he said unto them, Know ye not the parable? And how, the, how then will ye know all parables? The sower soweth the word. It's the sower. Parable of the sower. And you know what else they'll do? They'll say, turn to Luke 8.10. See, you guys don't want to listen to the Word of God. Turn to Luke 8.10. But one of the biggest things I've noticed about it when I was talking to that gentleman, um, and he was nice, he was a gentleman, 
uh, when I was talking to him, uh, he wasn't dispensational. When I got to, down to it and got to the heart of the matter, he's not dispensational. He doesn't believe in different dispensations. And yet when you tell him, do we st why, how come we don't do animal sacrifices anymore? You have the Old Testament and you've got the New Testament. He believes in that divide, which makes him dispensational. But he, re re he rejects dispensation as far as there being multiple dispensations in the Bible. Not just two, but multiple. Okay. Luke 8.10 Turn to Luke 8, 10, he says, and he, and he did this. And he said, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. See, the spiritual kingdom, it's the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom. But to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing that they might not understand, that's you, that's you, because you don't seem to understand the kingdom of God is that spiritual kingdom. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. It's talking about the sower again. But guess what I did? I said, if you just stop there, then yes. Yes. If you just stop there, if you just stop there, then it would make them like, oh, oh they're right. It's that spiritual kingdom. Okay? It's that spiritual kingdom, right? And know what I told them? I said, turn to Matthew chapter 3. Why don't we keep going with the parallel of the, the sower? Why don't we go back to Matthew verse 13? I mean... Verse 13. Matthew chapter 13, verse 11. Why don't we go back there? Okay, okay, let's go back there. Matthew 13, 11. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Not kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. For whosoever hath it to him shall be given. And he shall have more abundance, but whoso shall hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. I looked at him and said, "It's not talking about me. It's talking about you, that that man that I was, that young gentleman that I was talking to. It's talking about you not seeing. It's the kingdom of heaven." Matthew thirteen. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, 14, let's keep reading. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall not hear, and shall not understand. I'm sorry, by hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have, they have closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see and your ears, for they hear. You have to turn here, but John 8, 47 says, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Here's a parallel passage. We're going to keep going here. But remember when Jesus asked the disciples, who does the world say that I am? Oh, well, some say John the Baptist. Uh, some say Isaiah the prophet reborn. Some say um, uh, just one of the prophets. And then he asks them, Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. God manifests in the flesh. Thou hast the words of eternal life. Will you? There's another time when the disciples were leaving him, he asked, uh, not the, the, yeah, all, a lot of his disciples left him, and he asked the twelve apostles that were there, he's like, will you leave me also? And he's, he's like, where shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. He that is God heareth God's words. Matthew 13, 17, as we keep going, it says, For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them. To hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Verse 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. In Matthew, in Matthew the parallel version of the, of the sower, it says kingdom of heaven, not kingdom of God. And it's the, it's the parallel uh, story. When one heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which will see a seed by the wayside. Kingdom of heaven. 
kingdom of God can be a reference to the physical kingdom or it can be a reference to the spiritual kingdom. It can. And when I showed it this to him, you know what he did? He denied it. No, 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 it's still spiritual. No, it's not. Kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violent, and the violent take it by force. Kingdom of heaven is always a reference. Because I got him, before I even got into this, I got him to admit that the kingdom of heaven is that physical kingdom. Nowhere else in the Bible is it referenced as a spiritual kingdom. It's the physical kingdom. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's the physical kingdom. Then we got here. Now all of a sudden, it's not the, oh, no, no, otherwise it can still be, it can still be spiritual. No, it isn't. What's going on? You're dealing with someone who doesn't want the truth. Who can't see the truth for some reason. Could it be because he's blinded by respecter of persons? The, the people he's following, they're post mid trib therefore I have to be post mid trib no matter what. He's not following Jesus Christ, he's following those men. Could it be that he's lost and doesn't want to believe in a pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ? He'd rather believe a lie than believe the truth? Could it be saved and just newly saved and messed up? I start talking about dispensations. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, rightly divide. The word dispensation is in the Bible. The disp dispensation of grace is given to you where Paul's talking about, this is a new dispensation, and I'm giving you a gospel that God revealed to me for the time of the Gentiles, which is what we're in right now. The bride of Christ. The time of the Gentiles, the bride of Christ. Brothers, this is Christ, kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. They both can be, a uh, kingdom of God can be the spiritual kingdom, or it can be a reference to the physical kingdom. And what you have to do is 2 Timothy 2.15, which seems to be hard for some brethren to do lately, and people, but professing brethren, and some brethren, okay? We need to make sure we're rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay? That was the first thing I want. I'm sorry it took so long, but the kingdom of heaven. That's what this parable is about for the, the, the ten virgins. It's about the kingdom of heaven. Okay. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. What's the kingdom of heaven? It's talking about the physical kingdom. That thousand year reign that Jesus is going to be ruling and reigning. Okay. Where is it? Uh... Second, the second thing I want to point out here is there's an event that leads into the time of Jacob's trouble that causes the virgins to go forth to meet the bridegroom. Okay. Notice they are not the bride. They're not the bride going to meet the bridegroom. They're ten virgins. The bride is already with the bridegroom, but they're not going to meet the bride. They're going to meet the bridegroom. Okay. What happened to the bride? 2 Corinthians 11, 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you a chaste virgin unto Christ. This is to the, the church, the body of Christ, the, uh, the, in the day of the Gentiles, the salvation that's given to us today from the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ. He's espoused us. Okay, We're the bride of Christ, not the Jews. Amen. Okay. When you look up the word espoused, it says betrothed, promised in marriage by contract. By contract, it is written. You are sealed into the day of redemption. There's a contract. You get truly saved and born again. You become the bride of Christ, and you, you've got your, your ticket, your seat. You're going to be there at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, we read, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption shall have been put on, for, for this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass, saying, It is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. The law of sin and death, all gone, swallowed up in victory. What is the transition that leads into the time of Jacob's trouble? The body of Christ leaves. 
1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. This doesn't happen in the time of Jacob's trouble. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The body of the bride of Christ were in heaven being prepared for the marriage supper of the Lamb. You ask, well, what is that? We've talked about this in other studies. It's the judgment seat of Christ. The bride is being prepared for the marriage supper of the Lamb by going through the judgment seat of Christ. It's where our works get judged. Our life as a Christian gets judged. We're being judged. Okay? That's where we are. The Jews are, st are down here that didn't get saved. Now, what's the event? Okay, what's the event that causes them to go out into the wilderness? Okay, third, going out to meet him. Going out to meet him. There's an event <coughs> that leads into the time of Jacob's trouble. The body of Christ leaving. Then halfway into the time of Jacob's trouble, there's an event that causes the Jews to flee to the mountains. And that's where this starts. I believe this parable starts halfway into the time of Jacob's trouble. The Jews are fleeing. Now, Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, we read... Revelation 12, 14. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times, that's two or more, but for this, when you actually look into it, it's two, and half a time from the face of the serpent, three and a half years, times, times, and a half, three and a half years. So you have them leaving and fleeing. Why are they fleeing? Matthew 24, 15. When you go back to Matthew 24, what's Matthew 24? It's the time of Jacob's trouble. What's Matthew 25? When we read about the parable of the virgins, the ten virgins. It's the transition period from Matthew 24, which is the time of Jacob's trouble, to the day of the Lord. The kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God. Matthew 24, 15, it says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. That's what's causing this, them going out. Flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take away, take anything out of his house. You're just going with your body. Run, run. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. What did we read? Matthew 25, 1, which is, we're going through. The, um, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto the ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. They left. They have this fake and this fraud standing there saying, I'm Jesus Christ, I'm God, you're going to worship me. And these, and these Jews are saying, no, we're not going to worship you. They have to run and flee out. And they realize, okay, this guy is a hack. He's a counterfeit. They're running out into the wilderness, and they're waiting for the real Messiah to come back. The real bridegroom. The real king. Okay. So go back to Matthew 25, verse 2, the parable of the ten virgins. Matthew 25, 2. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Why is that? They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Well, I'm going to read the verses, but you got to endure to the end to be saved. Oil is that endurance. They didn't take the uh, they didn't take oil with them. So what happens? They don't endure to the end to be saved. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. They endured to the end. Now Matthew chapter 10 verse 22 we read Matthew 10:22. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Now stop right there. Is that for today? Some people will try to make it out like it's for today, but it says shall be saved. The only people that truly believe that that's for today are the ones that don't believe in eternal security. Today, I am present tense saved. Present tense saved. Now I'll have to make an apology. As I did this study, I started thinking through the scriptures and saying, you know what, Lord? I might have been wrong to say you can lose your salvation. But we'll get into that a little bit further. You can lose your salvation in the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, no, you don't have it until the very end. You have to endure to the end 
to be saved. It's endured to the end, shall be, future tense, shall be, not are saved, will be saved, shall be saved. You've got to make it to the end to be saved. Matthew 24, Matthew 24, Sermon on the Mount, the big sermon, 13, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Shall be. These virgins are Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. That's why it's called Jacob, the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob's another word for Israel. But they have to endure to the end to be saved. We get saved today, we're sealed into the day of redemption. Mark 13, 13 says, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And yet a lot of these post and mid-trib people, they'll grab these verses and say, it's for us today. And then you ask them, do you believe in eternal security? Oh yeah, I believe in eternal security. Then why are you using verses that don't promote, that go against eternal security? They're saying you're not present tense saved. You've got to make it to the end to be saved. And if you don't make it to the end, you don't get saved. Do you believe in eternal security today? When someone's saved, they're saved. Yes, I do believe that. But they try to make it out for that time period. It's not there. In the time of Jacob's trouble, it's not there. You get saved. If you repent, believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you, um, and I've been pushing this, but the more I study it, you're going to have Moses and Elijah come back, and I believe more than anything, they're going to be preaching the kingdom of heaven. It's not going to be repent and believe. It's going to be repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And that D Jesus, the ki your king that you crucified, is risen, and he's going to come back to rule and reign. And you've got to believe that. I believe it's the kingdom of heaven that's being preached in that time period. That's the gospel that's being preached. Yes, you have to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, how he died for our sins and rose again, uh, was buried and rose again the third day. But it's based off of, you've got to believe he's coming back to be your king. The kingdom of heaven. That thousand year reign's coming. The day of the Lord's coming. The kingdom of heaven is coming. That's the whole point. But you have to endure to the end. I don't have to endure to the end to be saved. Remember I told you when we were talking about this, where's the, the bride of Christ? We're in heaven. And what are we doing? We're being prepared for the marriage supper of the Lamb. How are we being prepared? We're going through the judgment seat of Christ. What can you lose today? You can lose a lot of things today. You can lose a lot of things today. Your health, your life, your testimony, rewards in heaven, the inheritance being able to come back and rule and reign with Jesus Christ in the day of the Lord. But the one thing you cannot lose is eternal life once God has granted it to you. Salvation. It's not yours to lose. In the time of Jacob's trouble, they don't have it. they got to make it to the end, and then God grants it. And the end of what? There's some that endure to the end to the point of having their heads cut off. They're beheaded for the testimony of Jesus Christ and for his, uh, please don't quote me, I like his commandments, his testimony. Along those two lines, the commandment is don't take the mark, don't worship the beast. They go hand in hand. And the testimony that, you know, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. For Jesus Christ, your king, who you crucified, he died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He's coming back to be your king. The day of the Lord is at hand. That's the testimony. But then there's the commandments. But they're beheaded. They endure to the end to the point of giving their life for Jesus Christ. Then there's those that endure to the end as far as the whole time of Jacob's trouble to the very end where Jesus Christ comes back. Okay. This is not for today. 2 Timothy 2.19, we read, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one of you name it the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. What's going on today? We can lose things today, but we can't lose salvation. Why? Because once it's granted to us, we have it. We are saved. We're not being saved. We're not, who are, we not shall be saved. We are saved. But we're told to depart from iniquity, the changed life, after salvation. But in a great house, there's not only vessels of gold and of silver. 
<coughs> excuse me, vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, talk about iniquity, the wood and the earth, the dishonor, you can fail the Lord and repent. And God is faithful to, to if you confess, if we confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Remember we read back there about us being there in the day of the Lord? I want to find that scripture again. Here's 1 Corinthians 1.8. Who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? What did we just read right there? If a man purge himself of these things, he shall be, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use. Will be usable in the time and the day of the Lord. Will be able to be used. And prepared unto every good work. But if you're that wood and earth, and you're not suffering for Jesus Christ, you're just indulging in the flesh because you fell away. You once did. You, you had a changed life. You were on fire for the Lord. You were running 100 miles an hour, like I said, and you hit that first wall. We all hit walls. How many of you have hit a wall, brother, says Christ, in your walk with the Lord? I've hit tons of them. How many of you hit, got tripped? I'm using some, uh, like a parable. How many of you have hit a, a log or a rock and tripped and fallen flat on your face? Some people don't get back up. God can get anybody back up. But some people, they, they trip, they fall, and they're done. I'm done with this. It's not what I thought it was. I, I, I'm going to get back into the flesh and the world and everything. And they don't amount to much as a Christian. A Bible-believing, God-fearing man, a saint, a saved sinner. Okay? And they, therefore they won't get to come back in the, in the day of the Lord. And serve God down here. Ephesians, but you're, I always say it's like it's a bad thing. You get stuck in heaven. And people say, well, that's not that bad. But those who truly love the Lord, we want to be able to serve God anywhere He is. And if, he, if God the Father comes down, manifests in the flesh and Jesus Christ comes down here to rule and reign for a thousand years, I want to be down here with Him. I want to be able to go wherever He goes. That's true love for Jesus Christ. Keeping His word so I can be where He is. If He's in heaven, I want to be in heaven. If He's down here on the earth, I want to be down here on the earth with Him. Okay, but if that saying you're stuck in heaven, what that what we're saying is is you're sealed into the day of redemption. If you're truly saved and born again, you're not being saved or shall be saved. You are saved, and you get to be in heaven. Ephesians four thirty says, "And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed into the day of redemption." You're sealed. Okay? They don't have that seal in the, in the time of Jacob's trouble shall be saved. In other words, you're not saved. You don't have that assurance that we have today. If God saves you, you're saved. In that time period, you've got to endure to the end, and then God will save you. See, I've been saying it wrong. Please forgive me, Brother Scott. I've been saying it wrong. In the time of Jacob's trouble, no, you can't lose your salvation. Why? Because it's not granted to you until the very end. You have to endure to the end to be saved. It's not guaranteed like it is today. Now there will be Jews, we'll talk about this a little bit further down, there will be Jews that have seal in their forehead that will not take the mark, but this parable is for the Jews, Jewish people as a whole. Okay, We're sealed into the day of redemption. You'll have some people there that are sealed until the end, enduring to the end, that end. They're sealed into the end when Jesus Christ comes back and starts His reign, the day of the Lord. Okay. But this parable is for all Jews. Could, be, could the five be the ones that are sealed, and the five be the ones that aren't sealed? Well, I think more than anything, I just look at it as in you got five wives that didn't that didn't take the mark, didn't worship the beast. They understood what the time period was, the time of Jacob's trouble. They understood what God was doing, that they deserved it, and they really focused hardcore on enduring to the end to be saved. And you have the, free, the, ten, the five foolish that don't take it seriously and like they're not prepared to endure to the end to be saved. And they don't make it. Okay. <clears throat> so you have five versions that take, the, that take the time of Jacob's trouble seriously and five that do not. Back to Matthew chapter, 
Matthew chapter 25, verse 5, back to the, to the parable. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Remember, they come out halfway through the time of Jacob's trouble, and they're out in the wilderness for three and a half years. They slumbered and slept. Now you turn to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, you read about Jan uh, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression. Okay, and you get that all figured out three and a half years going in. That's the first three and a half years. And then in Revelation, you have 12, 14, Revelation 12, 14, what we read before. And to the woman were given two weeks of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a times from the face of the serpent. They go out to meet the Lord, but he's not there instantly. They're having to endure to the end to be saved. This is three and a half years that they're having to live in the wilderness. And remember what we just read. They had to leave everything behind. Talk about being tough. Having to go back to, uh, what do they call it, uh, barbaric, being barbaric. Having to go back to using rocks, to, to rocks, try to find rocks that will help start fires. Having to make clothes, rudimentary, rudimentary clothes. And God is providing for them. He, I believe it. I'm getting ahead of myself, but God is providing for them. The Jews are out there in the wilderness for three and a half years waiting for Jesus Christ to come back. Some might start to miss the world. It's hardship. They had it easy, and now they have it hard. They might start missing the world, like some of the Jews came out of Egypt. Okay, and we're going to talk about this again, but in Egypt, remember, they kept complaining and whining. They didn't have, when they felt like they were going to run out of water... They're in the wilderness. They couldn't take anything with them. None of this great technology that we have today. They're in the wilderness having to live the old-fashioned way. What happened to the Jews when they came out of Egypt? Remember, Egypt's the type of the world, and they're fleeing from the world. Especially the lowercase g God of this world, into the wilderness. What did the Jews act when they left Egypt? They, they didn't have any water. Oh, I wish we would have died in Egypt. Oh, maybe we should just go back to Egypt. What happened when God, they ran out of food? Oh, I wish we would have gone back to Egypt. And then God rains manna down, bread from heaven, which I, what some believe is going to happen in the time of Jacob's trouble for these Jews, not Gentiles, these Jews that are out in the wilderness. When they gained the food after a while, guess what they did? They started whining and complaining again. Well, back in Egypt, we had meat. We had meat, sumptuous meat, and today all we have is this bread. Why? They kept missing the world. And they kept trying to find excuses to go back to the world. Brothers and sisters in Christ, do you find that struggle in your heart? And I do. Don't get me wrong, I do. I'm not going to lie. My flesh tries to tempt me to resurrect the old man and go back to doing things the world's way. And I have to keep telling myself and remind myself, fearing God is keeping His commandments, loving God is keeping His words, and I've got to remind myself of the judgment seat of Christ. I've got to remind myself that this isn't it. Okay? We're going to be living eternity with Jesus Christ, and we're going to have rewards. We've got the inheritance. This isn't it. It's not worth, for me. It's not worth me falling. Although there's still sometimes I do, and God picks me back up. It's that pull to go back to the world, to go back to the world. You think these Jews don't have it? Oh, yeah. It's going to be even harder then. I always talk to myself saying, if I lost this home, and God said, you know what, you're going to have to live out of your truck, and I've seen videos of men, old men, living out of their trucks. They have a top on the back of their truck, and they got a little bit on the left side, and they've got an ice cooler on the right, and maybe some books or some place to put your clothes. And that's how they're living. I said, Lord, if I have to go live like that, Lord, help me. Help me get through it, because it's going to be a drastic change from how I'm living now. They're going through a drastic change, and it's, and it's imminent. It's not like, okay, I can gradually get used to it. The moment he's that... Um, the man of sin, the son of perdition, sets himself up saying, I am and God, I am their king, worship me. They can't even go back to grab anything. It's instant. Run! Run! There's times in my life, brother, says Christ, where you start to see temptation, you run! 
When you start seeing that the world's trying to tempt you, the flesh is trying to tempt you, Satan's trying to tempt, Satan and his minions are trying to tempt you, uh, you run. You flee. There's times that I've jumped in my, I've done this before in my old ones. I got tempted sometimes. I was addicted, and that addiction's still there a little bit. I was addicted to Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, porn, um, sa uh, satanic style music. I was. And there's times where, I, even if it's pouring down rain and I'm stuck in sykes, I love the outdoors. God bless me with loving the outdoors now and getting away from this stinking computer. I use it when I have to. But it gets me out there. And there's times where it's pouring down rain, that temptation hits me. What do I do? I run. I jump in my truck and I drive out. There's a place where I can drive out and set there. And even though it's raining, I can crack the windows and hear the ocean. And I'll put on Alexander Scorvey reading the Bible. I'll start listening to some music and pray, like wordless music, and pray with God for hours. But this is Christ, when that world comes a calling, the lost world, the Egypt, or in their case, in the two, at the time of Jacob's trouble, you know, the lowercase she's got of this world, Mystery Babylon, and that whole system, you run. Sometimes you have to actually physically run from that temptation, get away from it. Spend some time with the Lord, hardcore. Okay. Revelation 18, 12. This is what they're running from. The merchandise, of, the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stone. They're running from the, the man of sin, but this is what they're leaving behind. I said that wrong. Forgive me, brother, says Christ. They're running from the man of sin, the son of perdition, but this is what they're leaving behind. The merchandise of gold and of silver and of precious stones and of pearls and of fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and of thine wood and all manners of vessels of ivory and all manners of vessels of most precious wood and of brass and of iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour, not just flour, but fine flour, and wheat, and beasts, meat, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, horses, you mean you have to walk now on rocks? Horses, and chariots, and slaves, you had people do work for you, now you got to do it yourself. And the souls of men, and the fruits that thy soul lusteth after, the fruits that thy soul lusteth after, are departed from thee. And all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. Now this is where the mystery of Babylon gets destroyed, absolutely. But in Revelation 12, 14, we read about the woman and how she goes out into the wilderness for times and times and half a times. What happens first? Then fleeing, and then later on, Mystery Babylon gets destroyed close to the end. Mystery Babylon gets destroyed, like within the last six months to a year of the time of Jacob's trouble, Mystery Babylon gets destroyed. The Jews are already fleeing, and they're already in the wilderness, so Mystery Babylon, I believe, is still there. All this stuff is still there to entice them. Oh, you don't want to live in that pesky wilderness. Come back in. Come back in from the rain and the cold. Come on in. That temptation. Right? Now imagine the Jews that went back to Mystery Babylon only to see everything get destroyed that took the mark and worshipped the beast. Oh, I can't handle out in the wilderness. I gotta go back. And they go back, they take the mark, they worship the beast, they got all this stuff back that they gave up when they had to run and flee to the wilderness, only to see all that stuff get destroyed. Like that. But this is Christ, that's why we keep saying for present day today. There's nothing in this world that's worth you turning against God. There's nothing in this world that's worth you not getting saved and born again for anybody that's lost that's watching this. To truly repent, humble yourself and repent, broken spirit, having sorrow for your personal sins that nailed Jesus to the cross and believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. How that he died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third days according to scripture. That it was God manifest in the flesh that was nailed to the cross. It was God's blood that was shed and his blood can wash our sins away. You confess both in prayer and you ask God to save you. There's nothing in this world that is worth you not doing that. Nothing. Brother says Christ, there's nothing in this world that's worth you falling and staying, and staying in a fallen state. There's nothing. 
There's nothing in this world that's worth you turning your backs on the brethren. You don't think some of these Jews will, will turn their back on each other in that time period? Well, no. Today we're seeing it, the, fall, the great falling away today before the time of Jacob's trouble, before the catch away of the body of Christ. There's a falling away right now and we're seeing it. And the brethren are turning on each other. They're not sticking to the scriptures. You have brethren that are falling away. They're adding to the scriptures. They're subtracting from the scriptures. They're making up false teachings to justify their sin and their wickedness, their worldliness. Them going back to the world versus standing firm and strong to doing things God's way. They stop, they, they stop fearing the Lord. They stop loving Jesus Christ, which is keeping His word. That Egypt has, a, has a, a great pull on people, brothers and Christ. It has a pull on me. And I got to, by God's grace, I got to stay in this book day, every day, every morning, every night. I'm praying all the time. Why am I doing that? Because I know the moment I stop, Egypt's going to come whisper in my ear. Come on, come on. You know what they say about this book, brothers and Christ? I love this saying. You know, I didn't come up with this saying, but I love this saying. God's word will keep me from sin, or sin will keep me from God's word. Every time I've ever fallen into sin and wickedness, brothers and Christ, it kept me, it, it, it hindered my prayer life, it hindered my Bible reading life, and it hindered my Bible study life. It hindered me living for the Lord. And God had to pick me back up every time I fell. Okay. So what's going on here? They're being enticed. They can be enticed to go back to the world. These these virgins. That's what that oil is. It's endurance. You have some that were wise that took extra oil. They knew they had to endure to the end. And that shall and then they shall be saved if they endure to the end. But then you have those that didn't take it seriously, and they didn't have enough oil. They didn't endure to the end. 